When Hitler Stole Pink Rabbit, Chapter 3 After that, everything seemed to go very quickly, like a film that has been speeded up. Heimpy was busy sorting and packing all day long. Mama was nearly always out or on the telephone, arranging for the lease of the house or for the storage of furniture after they had gone. Every day when the children came home from school, the house looked more bare. One day, Uncle Julius kept called while they were helping Mama to pack some books. He looked at the empty shelves and he smiled. You'll be putting them all back again, you know. That night, the children were woken by the sound of fire engines. Not just one or two, but about a dozen were clanging their bells and racing along the main road at the end of their street. When they looked out of the window, the sky above the centre of Berlin was brilliant orange. Next morning, everyone was talking about the fire which had destroyed the Reichstag, where the German parliament met. The Nazis said that the fire had been started by revolutionaries and that the Nazis were the only people who could put a stop to that sort of thing. So everyone must vote for them at the elections. But Mama heard that the Nazis had started the fire themselves. When Uncle Julius called that afternoon, for the first time he did not say anything to Mama about her being back in Berlin in a few weeks' time. The last days Anna and Max spent at school were very strange. As they were still were not allowed to tell anyone that they were leaving, they kept forgetting about it themselves during school hours. Anna was delighted when she was given a part in the school play and only remembered afterwards that she would never actually appear in it. Max accepted an invitation to a birthday party which he would never be able to attend. Then they would go home to the even emptier rooms, the wooden suit crates and the suitcases, the endless sorting of possessions. Deciding which toys to take was the hardest part. They naturally wanted to take the games compendium, but it was too big. In the end, there was only room for some books and one of Anna's stuffed toys. Should she choose Pink Rabbit, which had been her companion since she could remember, or a newly acquired woolly dog? It seemed a pity to leave the dog when she had hardly had time to play with it, and Heimpy packed it for her. Max took his football. They could always have more things sent on to them in Switzerland, said Mama, if it looked as though they were going to stay there for a very long time. When school was over on Friday, Anna went up to her teacher and said quietly, I shan't be coming to school tomorrow. We're going to Switzerland. Fräulein Schmidt did not look nearly as surprised as Anna expected, but only nodded and said, Yes, yes, I wish you luck. Elspeth was not very interested either. She just said she wished she herself were going to Switzerland and that this was not likely to happen because her father worked in the post office. Gunther was the hardest person to leave. Max brought him back to lunch after they had brought back from school together for the last time, though there were only sandwiches because Heimpy had not had time to cook. Afterwards, they played hide-and-seek rather half-heartedly among the packing cases. It was not much fun because Max and Gunther were so gloomy and Anna had to struggle to keep down her own excitement. She was fond of Gunther and sorry to leave him, but all she could think was, this time tomorrow we'll be on the train. This time on Sunday, we'll be in Switzerland. This time on Monday? At last, Gunther went home. Heimpy had sorted out a lot of clothes for his mum in the course of her packing, and Max went with him to help him carry them. When he came back, he seemed more cheerful. He had dreaded saying goodbye to Gunther more than anything. Now, at least, it was over. Next morning, Anna and Max were ready long before it was time to leave. Heimpy checked that their nails were clean, that they both had handkerchiefs, two for Anna because she had a bit of a cold, and that their socks were held up properly by elastic bands. Goodness knows what state you'll get into you by yourselves, she grumbled. But you'll be with us again in a fortnight, said Anna. There's a lot of dirt can settle on a neck in a fortnight, said Heimpy darkly. Then there was nothing more to do until the taxi came. Let's go right through the house for the last time, said Max. They started at the top and worked down. Most of it no longer looked like itself. All the smaller things had been packed. Some of the rugs had been rolled up 
and there was newspaper and packing cases everywhere. They ticked off their rooms as they went through them, shouting, Goodbye, Papa's bedroom. Goodbye, landing. Goodbye, stairs. Don't get too excited, said Mama as, she passed, as they passed her. Goodbye, hall. Goodbye, drawing room. They were getting through too quickly, so Max shouted, Goodbye, piano. Goodbye, sofa. And Anna took it up with, Goodbye, curtains. Goodbye, dining table. Goodbye, hatch. Just as she shouted, Goodbye, hatch, its two small doors opened and Heimby's head appeared, looking through from the pantry. Suddenly, something contracted in Anna's stomach. This was just what Heimpy had often done to amuse her when she was small. They had played a game called Peeping Through the Hatch, and Anna had loved it. How could she suddenly be going away? In spite of herself, her eyes filled with tears and she cried idiotically, Oh, Heimpy, I don't want to leave you in the hatch. Well, I can't pack it in my suitcase, said Heimpy, coming into the dining room. You're sure you'll come to Switzerland? I don't know what else I'd do, said Heimpy. Your mamma has given me my ticket and I've got it in my purse. Heimpy, said Max, if you suddenly found you had a lot of room in your suitcase, only if, mind you, do you think you could bring the games compendium? If, 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 said Heimpy, my gran if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a bus and we could all go for a ride in her. That was what she always said. Then the doorbell rang to announce the arrival of the taxi and there was no more time. Anna hugged Heimpy. Mama said, don't forget the men are coming for the piano on Monday. And then she too hugged Heimpy. Max could not find his gloves, but had them in his pocket all the time. Bertha wept and the man who looked after the garden suddenly appeared and wished them all a pleasant journey. Just as the taxi was about to drive off, a small figure rushed up with something in his hand. It was Gunther. He thrust a parcel at Max through the window and said it was something about his mum, which they could not understand because the taxi had started. Max shouted goodbye and Gunther waved. Then the taxi went up the street. Anna could still see the house and Heimpy and Gunther waving. She could still see a bit of the house. At the top of the street, they passed the Kentner children on their way to school. They were talking to each other and did not look up. She could still see a tiny bit of the house through the trees. Then the taxi went round the corner and it all disappeared. It was strange travelling on the train with Mamma and without Heimpy. Anna was a little worried in case she felt sick. She'd been train sick a lot when she was small and even now that she had more or less outgrown it, Heimpy always brought a paper bag just in case. Did Mamma have a paper bag? The train was crowded and Anna and Max were glad that they had window seats. They both looked out at the great landscape, tearing past until it began to rain. Then they watched the raindrops arrive with a splash and slowly trickle down the glass pane. But now it became boring. What now? Anna looked at Mama out of the corner of her eye. Heimpy usually had a few apples or some sweets about her. Mama was leaning back in her seat. The corners of her mouth were pulled down and she was staring at the bald head of the man opposite without seeing him at all. On her lap was her big handbag with a picture of a camel on it which she had brought back from some journey with Papa. She was holding it very tight. Anna supposed because the tickets and passports were in it. She was clutching it so hard that one of her fingers was digging right in the camel's face. Mama, said Anna, you're squashing the camel. What, said Mama. Then she realised what Anna meant and loosened her hold on the bag. The camel's face reappeared to Anna's relief, looking just as foolish and hopeful as usual. Are you bored? asked Mama. We'll be travelling right through Germany, which you've never done. I hope the rain stops soon so that you can see it all. 
Then she told them about the orchards in southern Germany. Miles and miles of them. If only we were making this journey a little later in the year, she said, you'd be able to see them all in blossom. Perhaps just a few of them might be out already, said Anna. But Mama thought it was too early and the bald man agreed. Then they said how beautiful it was and Anna wished she could see it. If the blossom isn't out this time, she said, can we see it another time? Mama did not answer at once. Then she said, I hope so. The rain did not let up and they spent a lot of time playing guessing games, at which Mama turned out to be very good. Though they could not see much of the country, they could hear the change in people's voices every time the train stopped. Some were almost incomprehensible and Max hit on the idea of asking unnecessary questions like, Is this Leipzig? Or what time is it? Just for the pleasure of hearing the strangely accented replies. They had lunch in the dining car. It was very grand, with a menu to choose from. And Anna had frankfurters and potato salad, which was her favourite dish. She did not feel train sick at all. Later in the afternoon, she and Max walked through the train from the end, end to end and then stood in the corridor. The rain was heavier than ever and dusk came very early. Even if the orchards had been in blossom, they would not have been able to see them. For a while, they amused themselves by watching the fleeing darkness through their reflections on the glass. Then Anna's head began to ache and her nose began to run as though she, to keep pace with the rain outside. She snuggled back in her seat and wished they would get to Stuttgart. Why don't you look at Gunther's book, said Mama. There have been two presents in Gunther's parcel. One, from Gunther to Max, was a puzzle. A little transparent box with a picture of an open-mouthed monster drawn on the bottom. You had to get three tiny balls into the monster's mouth. It was very difficult to do on a train. The other was a book for both children from Gunther's mum. It was called They Grew To Be Great and she had written in it Thank you for all the lovely things. Something to read on the journey. It described the early lives of various people who had later become famous and Anna, who had a personal interest in the subject, leafed through it eagerly at first. But the book was so dully written and its tone was so determinedly uplifting that she gradually became discouraged. All the famous people had had an awful time. One of them had a drunken father, another had a stammer, another had to watch, wash hundreds of dirty bottles. They had all had what was called a difficult childhood. Clearly you had to have one if you wanted to become famous. Dozing in her corner and mopping her nose with her two soaked handkerchiefs, Anna wished that they would get to Stuttgart and that one day in the long distant future she might become famous. But as the train rumbled through Germany in the darkness, she kept thinking, difficult childhood. Difficult childhood, difficult childhood.